All right, so um, like Byron said, I'm Kevin Hoffman. I've done, uh, I've been using NATS for as long as I can remember. Uh, I think the first version of NATS I used was still the, the Ruby version. So um, what I wanna talk about is the NATS execution engine. And that's an experiment that we've been building internally and uh, we're really excited to move it towards open source where we can get some, where we can start getting you know, uh, feedback from uh, more than just us. And the this experiment came about when uh, we started taking a look at the types of um, topologies and infrastructure that people, people were using to build and deploy uh, distributed applications on NETs. And one common thread that we saw is that you'd have this set of infrastructure over here for NETs and your data plane and the communications between applications. And then you'd have a separate set of infrastructure where the map looked almost identical, but it's only there for deployment. And so we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could use the same NETS topology and infrastructure to not only supply the data plane for our apps, but actually deploy them as well. So that's what I wanna show off uh, today. We'll see if this actually works. Okay, um, I should be sharing my terminal, and uh, if not, just uh, you know, enhance a few times at the screen, and it should start looking better. All good. All right, cool. So the first thing I want to show is uh, the, the NATS execution engine is um, a separate binary. It's not built into the NAT server, but it's designed to run anywhere that's within reach of a NAT server. So that could be anywhere all the way in the back of a cloud somewhere, or, uh, you know, it could be on the far edge on Raspberry Pis, things like that. And so uh, the execution engine itself uh, it sits on top of things like uh, Firecracker. So uh, one thing that I want to show is that uh, things like Firecracker and virtualization and all those things are typically uh, a pain to set up. So one of the things that we've done is we've got this uh, pre-flight uh, sort of checklist. And what this does is it takes the configuration that I want to run and looks at it and then tells me what I'm missing and what I'm not. And so I've got all of my CNI plugins, got my Firecracker binary and my path, but what I'm missing is the root file system uh, that, that Nex is gonna use. So if I hit yes here, uh, depending on, okay. So before I could finish my sentence, I've got all of my uh, prerequisites installed. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, start up the node server process and uh, right so there's a bunch of spam here but what's interesting is that the uh, the node server is connected to NATS and uh, it's started a, a pool of virtual machines so uh, we should be ready to deploy some workloads to it. And so one of the things I can do is I can get a list of the next nodes running. And this should look fairly similar to the list of, you know, NAT servers. I'll get some node info here and you can see um, this X key here should give you a hint that we're going to use some encryption. Uh, and you know, I've got some, some tags here. Some of these are built in, uh, and then some of these are supplied through my config. So the first thing I want to show is 
how to take a workload and run it inside next. And so the, the workload that I'm going to show is uh, just a simple echo service, right? It's, um, uh, let's see if I can, right. All right, it's just a simple Go program. Um, it's statically compiled, and all it does is take the NATS URL from the environment and uh, start up an echo handler where, you know, it just replies to the echo, just replies to the topic. So I'm going to deploy this and so I'm going to use a command called dev run. One thing that I've learned um, the hard way is that the, the developer loop when you're trying to build things is very, very different than uh, the set of commands that you run in production. So what we've done is make it so that in with the dev run command, it automates a whole bunch of the stuff that we would need to do explicitly in production. So I can just keep hitting dev run, uh, and if this binary changes, it's just going to redeploy the new binary. So uh, let's see. Yeah, that should do it. Uh, so we saw that my workload was accepted, and like I said, it's just a straight up binary. There's nothing special about it. Um, so now I should be able to. My demo should work, and theoretically, if I don't typo. Okay, so I've deployed this service, and it is running inside an X node inside a Firecracker VM. So zero trust. And um, another interesting piece here is that it also takes advantage of the Nets uh, services framework. So. I can see that echo service is actually deployed and is actually running and advertising itself as a service. Uh, so with that, I can I can get uh, I think it's stats. Yep. So I've got one request so far, and I make another one. Now I got two. So. Uh, not only am I deploying this service, but it's also taking advantage of the whole uh, services ecosystem. And so you're probably thinking, what could possibly be better than deploying uh, static binaries to NATS infrastructure anywhere that's within reach of a, net, of a NATS server? And interestingly enough, uh, I do have something that's even more even more fun. So I have this tiny little JavaScript uh, file, and the it's a function that takes a subject and a payload, and the subject is the subject on which my function was triggered, and the payload is the, the payload of the function. And uh, what I return uh, will be replied to when I make my request. So let's see what happens. If I try and run or deploy, um, I'm a little uh, clipboard issue here. So let's see what happens if I try and just straight up deploy a .js file. There's no uh, there, there's no orchestration framework in here. There's no Nomad, no Docker, no, nothing like that. I'm just going to run the deploy the JavaScript function and um, so, in theory, uh, where's the info? Here we go. So now you can see I actually have two workloads running on this node. One is Echo Service, and the other one is Echo Function JS. And if we look at the this uh, command I ran, the trigger subject here is funk .echo. So I can now invoke that function on that subject. So 
So now I got a reply from my JavaScript function, and I can also get replies from my 64-bit uh, static link binary. And again, you're probably thinking, Kevin's going to end the demo here because there's just so much good stuff I can't take anymore. Uh, and you're wrong. I'm going to call, I'm going to do one more uh, workload type. And I'm going to do a WebAssembly function. So this uh, .wasm file is, uh, was written in Rust, and it just does uh, simple, it's just a simple request reply pattern. But again, this is a function, not a service, and it's going to be deployed on next as uh, just like all of my other workloads are. And I'm going to trigger that one on a, a WASM func uh, subject. So now I can do WASM echo. So the Rust function that I wrote not only replies with the original payload, but it also tells me which func which subject I used to trigger it. So you can set wildcards and multiple different subjects to trigger your functions. And when we invoke the function on your behalf, we tell you which function which subject uh, it came in on. So you can do things like, you know, tokenize it and you know pull off whatever metadata you need. Um, so let's see here. So now um, you should be able to see that I have uh, my uh, static binary running. I've got a deployed JavaScript function that will run on demand anytime I hit the appropriate subject. And I have a WebAssembly function that's deployed and will also run on demand whenever I use a subject to trigger it. So, uh, like I said, this is an experiment, and uh, everything that I've shown so far is what we plan is part of what we plan on making open source. So, um, you'll be able to play with all of this good stuff. Uh, there's also a user interface, uh, but I'm gonna, you know, hold back some surprises for next time. And uh, that is pretty much it. Um, you know, there's there's a few uh, a few extra commands I can run, but yeah, you can. Oh, a couple of important things: you, if you don't want to use the rootfs that we ship with, you can make your own, so you can build your own VM image. Uh, and if you really want to, you can use that uh, feature to build an image that has the Docker daemon installed, and you can even deploy a fourth uh, workload type uh, Docker images to this uh, setup. And the reason why I don't include it by default is the Docker daemon adds uh, almost 500 megs to the VM image, so it's one of those things that you want to opt into as a last resort. But yeah, so now you can deploy any workload uh, within reach of any NATS infrastructure and manage it all centrally. So let me see if I can figure out how to stop sharing. I think I uh, speak on behalf of the chat, but just wait until you see how, how you blew it up. <clears throat> Let's just put it that way. The excitement is mad, and that was a fantastic, fantastic demo, Kevin. Really awesome. Yep. Um, there's going to be, uh, we've still got a few things to do before uh, we make it public, but you know, the repo is, uh, is ready to roll, and uh, stay tuned to the NAT Slack and blogs and videos and things to, uh, we'll be doing updates and, uh, you know, I've got some sample applications that are built on this. Oh, uh, that reminds me, one other thing that is part of the open source is it's multi-tenant. So I can lump all of my workloads into a namespace and, uh, 
you know, Byron could lump all of his workloads into another namespace. They won't be able to talk to each other. They have separate credentials, separate security, separate encryption, and uh, they all still just run. So, um, yeah, basically I've just built the tool I've always wanted to have uh, since the first day I started using NATS. So cool. Thank you so much, Kevin. This was fantastic.